All right, excellent. Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, so welcome to the 2016 Kidney Cancer Association Patient and Survivor Conference. Uh, this is our second annual uh, conference, uh, and we hope to continue on on an annual basis. Uh, sponsored by the Kidney Cancer Association uh, and hosted, of course, by our group here, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, CW Medicine, and Fred Hutch. Uh, I know uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, but for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Scott Tycote. I'm uh, an associate professor here in medical oncology. Uh, I'm a clinician. I see kidney cancer patients and melanoma patients in our clinic over at SCCA. Uh, I'm our medical director for kid the kidney cancer program. Um, and I'll be introducing in a moment uh, Carrie Koniski, uh coming to us from uh, the KCA, and she is the co-CEO. Um, as we get started, uh, uh, just to make a comment, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with our building, um, but if you need to take a restroom break outside into the hallway, take a left. When you, get, when you see the, the entry desk, take a left. You'll find closest restrooms. Uh, we'll have a break mid-morning, a lunch break uh, during the day as well. So good, I wanted to introduce our program today uh, and just a few comments as we go along. And so. Uh, the first slide here, just an overview of what's the burden of kidney cancer in the U.S. This is American Cancer Society data uh, for 2016. And so uh, many in the audience have a diagnosis of kidney cancer. How common is that? How many people are just like you uh, facing kidney cancer? An estimate of nearly 63,000 new diagnoses in 2016 with 14,000 uh, deaths from kidney cancer. Uh, and showing the, the incidence uh, for men and women, um, ranking uh, by, by the most common diseases, 5% uh, of uh, American men, 5% um, of all cancer diagnoses, kidney cancer, the seventh most common, 3% for women, the 10th most common diagnosis for the U.S. So our first topic this morning, I think, really addresses the question I'm often asked as I meet new patients, which is, uh, why did this happen? Why me? Why did I get kidney cancer? Uh, and we often don't have uh, an exact answer for that, but we do know there are some uh, risk factors and associations. Uh, kidney cancer is an age-associated cancer, like so many uh, carcinomas, uh, very rare in pediatric and adolescent populations and increases with advancing age. Uh, median age of diagnosis is 64. Uh, there's a male uh, predominance for kidney cancer, about two to one, and that cuts across pretty much all ethnic groups. Uh, there is an association with some modifiable uh, risk factors, smoking, obesity, uh, hypertension. Uh, so we can find one of those features in about half of, of all of our kidney cancer patients. There's associations with less common uh, things, uh, environmental exposures, uh, industrial agents, organic solvents, heavy metals, asbestos, uh, some disease associations that are less common, uh, patients with long-term kidney dysfunction, cystic changes in their kidneys, dialysis dependent, uh, seem to be at higher risk for kidney tumors. Uh, chronic hepatitis, sickle cell anemia have some association with kidney cancer. Uh, and certain drugs, uh, long-term high dose use of uh, analgesics, finastatin or aspirin, and perhaps prior cytotoxic chemotherapy exposure. Uh, but the first talk really uh, looks at patients that have a genetic risk for kidney cancer, a hereditary component for their disease. Um, so we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Fuki Hisama, uh, a professor in our Division of Medical Genetics and the medical director of our UW uh, Genetic Medicine Clinic uh, talking today with the title of her talk, Genetics of Kidney Cancer. Uh, so after Dr. Hisama, we're going to take a look at um, uh, surgical management of kidney cancer. So a figure here, uh, just to remind you, kidney cancer fundamentally is starting uh, in the kidney. Kidney tumor cells look the most like renal epithelial cells, the lining cells of the tubules in the kidney, uh, the, the business portion of the kidney. And like any cancer, there's a staging algorithm for kidney cancer, stage one, two, three, and four, which tells us something about um, the extent of growth and the, the prognosis, the risk of that tumor. Uh, you can see there's size criteria for placing uh, tumors into stage one or two. Uh, stage three implies impingement on, on uh, other structures within the kidney, blood vessels uh, getting outside of the kidney membrane. Uh, and stage four implies the spread beyond the kidney, so to distant sites in the body. Uh, stage one, two, and three, localized tumors only in the kidney, not elsewhere in the body, uh, are almost always going to be referred for surgical management. Uh, and what about our stage four patients? You have the spread of cancer at diagnosis uh, is their role for surgery. Um, 
this is a, a figure that just shows you what's the distribution of new diagnosis, uh, how do patients present with kidney cancer. So this is from a large uh, group of patients, a 12-year uh, interval uh, coming from a database that is incorporating data from over 1,600 U.S. hospitals, over 400,000 patients. So really giving you, I think, a very nice statistical snapshot of, of how do patients present uh, contemporarily with kidney cancer. So stage one tumors, uh, far and away the most common uh, diagnosis, half of patients. Stage two and three, again, the solid majority of patients have a localized tumor. Stage four, about 16% of patients at first diagnosis. Uh, and this is a figure um, coming from a group uh, in Boston, uh, Tony Schwery's group, uh, the Mass General and Dana-Farber program, uh, trying to look at the issue as is, is, is there a role, uh, a therapeutic role for doing nephrectomy surgery in the setting of metastatic disease? And so this is a survival figure, um, and we'll, we'll have these again. So um, to get you up to speed on what we're looking at, at time zero, all the patients are alive. And as you move through time uh, on the x-axis, uh, some patients are dying of their disease. And so the line is telling you what proportion of your population is still alive. So you want your line to stay very high near the top of the graph, meaning patients are still alive and surviving their disease. Bad is moving down near the bottom, and at the very bottom would be zero patients still living. And so uh, you'd like to be in a patient cohort. That is the line that's running higher in the graph, not lower. The red line, that's the better line, are patients that had a nephrectomy surgery uh, despite a diagnosis of metastatic kidney cancer. The black line are patients that did not have a nephrectomy. And these are all patients that are moving forward on, on state-of-the-art targeted therapy for their kidney cancer. So do you move directly to medical therapy and skip the surgery, or do you still have the surgery, and then as you recover, move on to therapy? Uh, as best we can tell, we think there's a therapeutic role and, and a benefit to having surgery, even in the, the setting of stage four metastatic disease. So the point being, virtually all of our patients, uh, there's going to be a thought, a discussion about getting in to see uh, a surgeon. So front and center in our clinical management is surgical therapy. Uh, and we're very happy to have uh, Dr. John Gore. Uh, I bet some of you here know him personally as your surgeon. Uh, he's an associate professor in our Department of Urology. and He'll be talking to us this morning about contemporary surgical management of localized and metastatic kidney cancer. Uh, after Dr. Gore, uh, we'll take a short break and we'll come back and I'll talk to you for um, uh, an interval about medical therapies for kidney cancer. Uh, and just as a brief introduction, uh, I have a timeline that shows you uh, all of, uh, by time points, uh, the medical therapies that we currently use for kidney cancer. And it goes back to 1986 with really uh, the first drug that we still use to some extent in kidney cancer interferon alpha. Before that time, there were no effective therapies uh, that have been proven to have benefit in kidney cancer. Uh, for a long interval, we used interferon and interleukin-2, drugs called cytokine therapies. So for 20 years, that was uh, state-of-the-art for kidney cancer. The world changed dramatically in 2005 with the first introduction of what are called targeted therapies, primarily oral agents that are now commonly used for all of our patients with kidney cancer. Uh, and the serafinib drug was followed rapidly by several other drugs in the same uh, general drug family. Uh, and the world has changed again just recently, and this is what we'll look at in some detail. Uh, November 2015, the first FDA approval of a brand new drug class, what's called an immune checkpoint blocking antibody, nivolumab or Abdevo. Uh, some of you here are probably actually receiving that drug. Uh, great interest in the field, and we'll see a little bit. Uh, it really, it's going to drive, I think, clinical development and be front and center in what's happening for kidney cancer for the foreseeable future. So I'll be talking uh, with the title, New and Emerging Systemic Treatment Options for Metastatic Kidney Cancer. Uh, then we'll move forward and uh, take a look at radiation-based therapy for kidney cancer. This is a little schematic that shows you the common destinations for um, spread of kidney cancer when it's stage four, when it's moved beyond the kidney. Uh, the most common organ of spread, the chest, so lungs or mediastinal lymph nodes. Other common destinations, liver and adrenal, bony lesions and 30 to 40 percent or more of kidney cancer patients. Uh, brain involvement, fortunately less common for kidney cancer than other diseases, but 10 or 15 percent of patients will have brain involvement. So depending on the destination of, of the metastatic lesion, uh, for some sites uh, we absolutely need the assistance of our radiation oncology colleagues. Uh, brain lesions will almost always be approached with radiation-based therapy. Uh, bony lesions often cause chronic pain, 
and our common uh, target for radiation therapy, sometimes large bulky lesions impinging on lung function or uh, abdominal organ function are excellent targets as well. So we're uh, pleased to have Dr. Jing Zhang that's here with us today, uh, an assistant professor in our Department of Radiation Oncology that will be talking to us with the title, Updates in Radiation Therapy for Kidney Cancer. Uh, at the end of the morning session, uh, we're going to have uh, Linda Kasser, uh, a registered dietitian in our SECA clinic. Uh, a question I'm often asked in the clinic when I meet patients is, uh, okay, I have this diagnosis and we're talking about these, these drugs and the therapy that's going to be applied, but what can I do uh, in my own life, my daily routine? Should I change my diet? Should I do something different? Should I start on supplements? Uh, what can I control that's going to influence uh, the course of cancer and what happens to me? So Linda's going to try and take this on uh, and, and talk to you a little bit with a talk titled Inflammation, Cancer, and Diet. Uh, I would ask uh, our morning speakers at the end of the morning session, depending on where we are time-wise, if we could all spend a moment to come down front and we'd be happy to uh, field questions uh, before we break for lunch. Uh, we'll come back and reconvene for the afternoon session. And uh, Dr. Kim Musinski, uh, she's covering the hospital service, so she'll be along uh, later on today, um, is going to address another question I'm commonly asked in the clinic that uh, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer. Uh, most of our patients have had nephrectomy surgery. They have one kidney. We're often looking at our lab panel, and the marker of kidney function is somewhat abnormal, the creatinine value. So what are the implications of that? What's going to happen over time if kidney function is abnormal, if you're functioning with only a solitary kidney? So Dr. Musinski is going to talk to us about assessing kidney function. How much do you really need? Uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, the afternoon session uh, with Art and Julie uh, Chimura. They are the local uh, coordinators for our uh, Seattle Kidney Cancer Association support group uh, and giving us a few comments on their perspectives as both a kidney cancer patient uh, and caregiver. Uh, 